Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. All right, church family, our choir got your heart ready to hear God's word this morning. Amen? Amen. Right? God is good. We've been walking, uh, starting a couple weeks ago, through a, a sermon series that we, we've, we're calling The Cross Has Spoken. The seven words of Jesus from the cross as we move towards Easter. I want to call your attention, as you walked in, you received a Be a Witness card, right? <clears throat> in it. This is what we are doing together as a church, right? That there are three people in your life right now that God is laying upon your heart to be praying for and that you would be looking for opportunities to share the hope in the good news of Jesus Christ. Guys, our culture is open to hearing the gospel, to being invited to church, to coming over for a meal, as we move towards Easter. So take advantage of this opportunity. We're gonna be praying about this this evening as well as for our students with Disciple Now next weekend, okay? So amen, you wanna be a part of that. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 19 as we continue in our series, The Cross Has Spoken. John chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. And please take that, make that your own. You can take that as a gift from us. You can keep it, you can mark in it. It is yours now. You need a copy of God's word. At the height of pain, Jesus' crucified body writhes. The crowd taunts and hurls abuse at him. If you are the king, save yourself. But as they mock Jesus, stunningly intercedes in prayer on behalf of those who are killing him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He will probably not speak again for an hour. That doesn't mean that the abuse stops. No, in fact, one of the criminals crucified next to him joins in the scorn. Jesus offers no rebuttal, simply silence. And as we unfolded last week, there was also a criminal crucified on the other side, that the Holy Spirit began to open his eyes and he comes to faith. Of all the criminals, on all the crosses, on all the hillsides, in the vast Roman Empire, on all the days he was crucified next to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And for the second time, Jesus spoke from the cross. Truly, I say to you, you shall be with me in paradise. It's time for us now to switch to John's gospel account of the crucifixion. John chapter 19. As we will see, there is this fitting moment where John himself draws near to the foot of the cross along with Jesus' mother and three other women. Undoubtedly, they are there to, to offer comfort of a familiar face. 
but instead they will be comforted by Jesus. So let's pick up in John 19, verse 23, as I read 23 through 27. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his outer garment and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of uh, Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother And the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we trust your word That your word has been preserved so as to reveal to us the character and nature of your son. That you have unfolded your own glory, your own magnificence. And that these details have been preserved for us so that we might learn and so that we might understand you who you are, so that we might approach you in truth and through your spirit. And so, Father, we pray this morning that through these words and through this testimony that you would convict our hearts, that you would teach us great things about even the suffering of Mary and all that she endured, that you are a God who who uses even suffering to reveal yourself and to reveal your heart. And you turn such things into glory for yourself and salvation. And I pray this morning, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you, that they would come to faith, seeing you on the cross, understanding your heart and your magnificence and all that is required of us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, certainly this is not the scene that Mary pictured when she celebrated the birth of her son. Angels announced his coming and even sent visitors, shepherds. And then later, Magi followed stars. And Mary believed amidst great difficulty and scorn from outsiders, right? She believed. And it was, she was counted blessed for her faith. I mean, think about this. She was the chosen one. The Messiah came from her, the incarnate Son of God. And she drank in all the details, marvelous details, many many of those written by prophets long ago. Undoubtedly, she dreamed of what would be. What is God doing? How marvelous is it going to be? But there was this one moment that kind of stuck out to her. It loomed in the far recesses of her mind, a prophetic warning. You see, when Jesus was just a baby and he was being presented at the temple for his purification and circumcision, 
Mary and Joseph were met by a man named Simeon who had been promised by the Lord that he would see the Messiah before his death. And finally, that day came. And the Spirit of God indicated to him that this was the child. And he runs over and scoops up the child, okay? And in magnificence, he announces a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. You see, he's quoting Isaiah 9-2. Now, this is the part all of us know about Christmas, right? We sing about this. But then... Simeon does something pointed. In Luke chapter two, verse 34, listen, it says, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Listen to me, Mary. He is a sign to be opposed. He reveals the very thoughts of a man's inner heart. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. Over the course of the next 30 years, all the excitement surrounding Jesus' birth, it settled into ordinary life. Right? Joseph was a carpenter and Mary a mother. And they returned back to Nazareth Jesus had four brothers, and the scripture simply tells us that he had sisters, so plural. And his upbringing was altogether ordinary. He was tempted and tested in every way, as you and I are, living our ordinary lives. Yet Jesus was without sin. I mean, sure, it's funny to think of the older brother complex, right? James, why aren't you more like your brother Jesus? You know, as a young parent, you're, you're really clueless as far as age and development, and you always take the, the oldest one and then compare all the rest to it, right? You're like, this kid can barely walk. I think Jesus was walking on water by this time. But funny aside, right? Scripture's absence of detail here is to articulate more than anything else that Jesus lived in one sense your life, an ordinary life. He was a young man who learned to be a carpenter at the feet of his dad, who loved and respected and honored his parents, who apparently mourned the loss of his father, Joseph. Fully human in every way, and in that sense, completely ordinary, yet without sin. Now, I share all of that with you because when Jesus starts his public ministry, It actually takes a huge toll upon his family, Mary included. You see, they are caught in the crosshairs of mounting public scrutiny. All right, at some point, they they had moved from Nazareth and uh, settled in uh, Capernaum, right? A small fishing village on the north bank of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus explodes on the scene. Seemingly overnight. And as he teaches and grows in notoriety, his hometown is perplexed. Wait a second. This is Jesus. We know him. We know his brothers and sisters. 
the whole family. He, he's not the Messiah. He's an ordinary carpenter. You see, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And as the scrutiny intensifies, right, leaders from Jerusalem zero in. They start to visit. Now, all of this culminates in what is probably the most embarrassing uh, scene in all of the Gospels. That is in Mark chapter 3. Jesus has begun his public ministry and he returns back to his hometown of Capernaum. And he is teaching in, uh, in a house. It's, it could be his house. It's some other house. The scripture just says he's teaching in a house. And large groups of people have gathered around. And then suddenly, his kinsmen show up. And, the, and then we're told his, his mother and brothers show up. And they are there uh, to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. They think Jesus has lost his mind. The family is perplexed. This is, this is too much. It's too fast. Right? It's certainly not what they had anticipated. And even Mary tries to stop him. Now, what I love about the Bible is that it doesn't hide the embarrassing moments of doubt and confusion like this. You see, Mary, who previously had great faith, here flat out does not understand and gets it all wrong even publicly opposes her son. I imagine Simeon's words come back to her at night. This child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and is a sign to be opposed. Now things don't get any easier for Mary. Okay, because while she's sorting through her, her own ideas and expectations, Jesus' brothers flat out do not believe. Okay, John tells us that plainly in John 7, 5. Okay, and they will not believe until the resurrection, when Jesus appears to them. That's when they will believe. So now back to our scene here at the cross. Jesus and a large group of disciples have been traveling to much notoriety from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem. And they are arriving the week before the Passover. Now, he knows that his hour has come. And he is there to present himself in Jerusalem as the Messiah. I do not imagine that Mary uh, nor Jesus' family is with him. But like good Jews, they are in Jerusalem to share the Passover with their kinsmen. All week long, messages have been swirling around in Jerusalem, and Jesus' family is divided. Most are embarrassed and ashamed. Mary is almost alone in her defense of Jesus, but still she has no understanding. Everything that unfolds continues to be a mystery to her. And then Friday morning, she gets the news. He's been arrested. And the leaders are trying to crucify him. She rushes to Antonia's fortress where Pilate has set up and begun to make pronouncements. As she comes up, she hears the crowd yell, scream, crucify him, crucify him. And then she stands idly by as they scourge her baby boy. I shudder to imagine a mother's pain as he collapses while he carries his cross, as they nail him to it. Certainly she feels every taunt 
of shame as they rain down abuse on him. And Jesus has been hanging on the cross for hours now. According to John 16, all the male disciples, except for John, have scattered, no doubt in fear of their lives. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that a small group of female disciples are in the crowd, but they have purposely remained distant. Now, possibly this is for their protection, or possibly the emotions are so much that you can't take it all in at once. Hours in, John tells us that he and four women approach the foot of the cross. Mary. Mary's sister, who is Jesus' aunt. She is unnamed. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, I don't have time to go into specifics, but when you compare this list here with Mark's gospel, it is possible to conclude that Mary's sister is uh, Salome, who is John's mother, meaning that John very well could be Jesus' cousin. Anyways, that's just speculation. You're piecing some things together. But Mary and her sister approach the cross. Where is the rest of Jesus' family? Here, at the climactic scene, there are only two. Now, this is a perfect time for me to pause and to articulate that sometimes the most difficult people in our lives for us to witness to are family members. Jesus divided his own family. In fact, he explicitly stated in Luke 12, do not suppose that I came to grant peace on earth, I tell you, but rather division. Uh, For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. I know many of you here know the sting and pain of a divided family, right? That, that you have said to your family members, I am a Christian. Jesus has saved me. But many of them here, they look and they say, look, we know you. You're ordinary you, Right? And they don't give your testimony a second thought, right? And anyways, who are you to tell them about God? So I know that when we pray for our three, as we move towards Easter, many of you are going to be praying for family members. Can I give you two quick encouragements before we move on? Number one, pray. Okay? Why? Because When we pray, we are declaring, God, you save, not me. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit that opens eyes, that convicts, that brings to salvation, not you. So I want to take the pressure off, right? You are being faithful when you pray. So we did this a couple years ago. Set an alarm for, I don't know, one o'clock. We did this a couple years ago. Set an alarm for one o'clock, every day at one o'clock, and you can pray for one minute for your three, okay? But you're trusting God, trusting God. And number two, I would say, don't give up. All right, it was, it was just a few months ago that I had a family come up to me and say, you will not believe after decades of praying for my mother, okay, who, who wasn't just not a Christian, she was opposed to Christianity, she got saved. And, and I got to go visit her and follow up and have that conversation. 
And also, a short time ago, I had a, a grandmother meet me right here at the foot of the altar at the end of a service that said, hey, you remember two years ago when we prayed for who's your one and set my alarm for one o'clock and prayed for one minute? My grandson, he was that one, and he just got saved, okay? So don't give up, okay? Don't give up. Pray that God would use you, but pray that God would also use other people, other Christians in their lives. Do not give up. And remember, the pressure is not on you. Simply give it to the Lord. Now, I can only imagine that Mary has drawn to the foot of the cross in order to provide Jesus with some comfort. With everything within her, she wants to tell him, everything will be all right, son. But how can she? Because he hangs crucified. All is tragic. Mary is in utter shock. Whenever she goes to open her mouth, no words come out. And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. You see, with his dying breath, Jesus speaks now for the third time in order to lovingly care for his mother. As the oldest in the family, it was his duty to provide and to protect for his aging mother. He had been looked to since Joseph's death. And normally at this moment, right, Jesus would pass the torch along to his younger brothers. But remember, they do not believe they're actually hiding in shame because of Jesus. And here his mother stands at the foot of the cross. Now remember again all that has transpired. Remember the wave after wave of attack. The Son of God crucified, bearing the curse of sin upon his shoulders. He is mocked. He is insulted. He is writhing in pain. And in a moment of tenderness, Jesus sees his mother and then looks to John and says, here is my only earthly inheritance, John. Treat her as if she were your own. He is thinking of her. He is caring for her. He is providing for her. Behold the beauty of the cross. God revealed. Who prays for the very ones killing him who does not save himself, but instead saves the crucified criminal next to him, who while dying thinks to tenderly care for his mother. Behold the beauty of the cross. But I bet I know what you're thinking right now. Pastor, why does he call her woman? I mean, in the very next sentence, he tells John, here is your mother. Why does he distance himself by calling her woman? Now, there are two things at play. Remember back in John chapter 2, when Jesus is at a wedding in Cana, and the host embarrassingly runs out of wine. And Mary turns to Jesus as if to say, do something about this. This is embarrassing. Do something. Okay? 
His response to her is, woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And it's a great narrative because she pays no attention to him and just turns to the waiters and says, do whatever he says, okay? He's going to fix this. Now, this is a fascinating rabbit hole, right, of speculation because Mary knew that Jesus could fix the situation, right? So how many times at home did Jesus just fix something? All right, and I know I've teased you, and I've lost half of you because your mind is just going to chase down that rabbit hole, but there is a point, so stop, stop, all right? There is a point. Here is the point. John brackets Jesus' ministry. It begins, woman, my hour has not yet come. And then here at the cross, woman, here is your son, meaning his hour has come. But you say, Pastor, that still does not answer the question. Why does he distance himself from his mother by calling her woman? Yes, the title is respectful, it is polite, but it's not enduring, it's not an enduring cry of mama. Why? Because Jesus must now establish himself as her Lord and Savior. You see, Mary was the first to meet him as she stirred in her womb, as he nursed on her breast. Mary met her son in the manger, but now she had to meet her Savior at the foot of the cross. As Jesus' ministry began, the important transition begins to happen in Mary's heart. Because he is a sign, he is appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel. He is a sign to be opposed. He is the revealer of truth of every heart. And a sword to even pierce Mary's own soul. You see, she too must feel the sting of conviction and repent. Repentance is like antiseptic, right? You you, you pour it into a wound and it stings, but it heals. That's how repentance works. It creates an inner turmoil because you have to admit things that you don't want to admit. You have to acknowledge weakness whenever you don't want to acknowledge weakness. However, that's the only way that you find the peace and forgiveness of the cross. Only when you acknowledge your shortcomings, it's when you find the peace offered in Jesus Christ. So Mary now stands at the foot of the cross, a believing disciple of the Son of God, she too comes with all of her mess, all of her confusion, all of her sin to the foot of the cross, the only place where there is hope and healing. She is brave. When most others fled, She is one of the few who remains, and she has much to fear as she is his mother. She is faithful. She is believing. When the rest of her children rejected, when both of her kinsmen reject, here she stands at the foot of the cross. But you must remember, she has no expectation of an early terrible death followed by a resurrection. She stands confused by it all, but I imagine her faith at this moment is much like Peter in John chapter 6, where she says, Jesus, here I am. Where else can I go? See, the resurrected Jesus will appear to her and to his brother James, and the fog will lift for Mary. Mary. 
and everything will start to make sense. You know, Mary is in the upper room with the disciples when the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost. And she will live out the rest of her days as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, friend, I ask you, If the mother of Jesus, the chosen blessed virgin, if she needed Jesus to die for her sins, then so do you. And if a sword of conviction pierced even her soul, Because when Jesus speaks and he teaches, it it discerns and opens up the heart and the thoughts of man, and they become exposed before a holy God. If that happened to her, and if she needed to repent and to feel that sting and then find the healing that's only found in the cross, well then, so do each and every one of us need to come to the foot of the cross where you can find hope and healing and life. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we have contemplated the incredible suffering, not only of your son, but also of your servant, Mary, what it must have been like in her confusion, in her suffering. And yet she believed. Yet she came to the cross for life. We see that light and we hear that light. And we too respond. Where else can we go? You have the words of truth and life, King Jesus. And you have died for every one of our sins. And we rejoice in that. Father, if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that does not know you, I pray that you would save. I pray that they would see the need to kneel at the foot of your cross and to find life, even as Mary found life. Father, those of us that know you, we rejoice in that life. It is true. It is good. It continues to grow in us. And we long for more and more and more of it. That your words would pierce and convict our hearts dividing out that which is selfish, unfruitful, and at times downright sinful. And that you would keep calling us to life, abundant life. We know that that's the reason you died on our behalf. It's in your name we pray, King Jesus. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, this is your chance to respond. However, the Holy Spirit of God has pressed your heart this morning. I'd like to think, right, as we're combing through the incredible details that have been preserved for us, right? There is much that God could have preserved, but this is what he chose to preserve so that we might examine and understand and think well of the cross that undoubtedly he is working on all of us to think through the magnificence of the death of his son. God revealed in flesh dying on a cross. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you, who'd love to walk through whatever it is that you need to walk through because we don't do this alone. You don't have to carry burdens or confusion alone. However, the Spirit of God 
has spoken, you be obedient to respond. Would you stand?